FAXA Research Foundation understands that it is vital to engage people around the world. By bringing together Fragile X organizations for World Day, working together, we are changing the world. Fragile X Australia has been a family support organization for over 30 years. A key challenge in Australia is ensuring that health professionals recognize Fragile X early so that children can receive appropriate treatments as soon as possible. We have been working on the training of the training of Approximately one in 5,000 children around the world have fragile X syndrome, and that makes it close to 4 lakh individuals in India alone. Let's spread awareness on fragile X and make a difference. In the year 1998, a group of parents funded the Association Syndrome X Fragile de Argentina. Nuestra misión es dar acogida a las familias que acaban de recibir el diagnóstico, transmitiendo nuestra experiencia. Africa as a continent is totally unaware of fragile eggs. We have 250,000 people that carry the premutated gene. We've been trying to raise awareness from Cape to Cairo. It's an uphill battle, but we will succeed. The 2020 Fragile X Center was established in Georgia. Our team is actively involved in uh, raising awareness about Fragile X Syndrome in Georgia and helping parent organizations to be stronger together. Please welcome Hui Kai, Program Chair, VP and Head of Content, Wushiap Tech, to kick off the online event. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to the 10th episode of Wuxi Aptac Rare Disease Webinar Series, Collaborations That Transform. This event series was launched in 2020, focusing on science and collaborations for patients. In the course of this journey, our passionate speakers have shared amazing stories and insights on a wide variety of rare diseases. Last year, our Fragile X event drew more than 5,000 registrations from industry, academia, the medical community, and the patient communities around the world, bringing inspirations to all of us. Today, on Fragile X Awareness Day, we are delighted to partner once again with Fraxa Research Foundation and many other Fragile X organizations around the world to showcase innovations at the forefront of tackling Fragile X syndrome. Fragile X syndrome is a genetic disorder caused by FMR1 gene mutation. This disease is recognized as the most common genetic cause of autism and causes a range of developmental problems, including learning disabilities and cognitive impairment. Unfortunately, there is no cure. Today, we are very honored to showcase more than 30 innovators, the progress in Fragile X gene therapy, gene reactivation, protein replacement, targeted therapy, and the drug repurposing, as well as their collective efforts in finding a cure for this devastating disease. Together, we hope to raise awareness about Fragile X syndrome to foster new thinking that advances scientific breakthroughs and to strengthen global connections among us. At the Wuxi Aptac, we firmly believe that a healthy future is only possible when we all work closely together. Thank you for joining us today. Let's tune in now. Please welcome Katie Clapp, President and Co-Founder, Fraxa Research Foundation. Welcome. We're so glad you're joining us. I'm Katie Clapp, president and co-founder of Fraxa Research Foundation. I'm also mother of Andy, who has Fragile X Syndrome. 30 years ago, Andy was diagnosed with Fragile X, and that started a journey that has entirely changed our lives. 
we just couldn't accept the future that Fragile X presented to Andy. And so my husband, Michael Tranfalia, and I and another mom launched Fraxa to fund research to offer hope to our family and hundreds of thousands of other families around the world who live with Fragile X. Today, Wuxi App Tech and Fraxa present collaborations that transform Fragile X, innovative approaches to finding a cure. Looking through the roster of presenters, I can hardly believe the powerhouses we have in our corner, all pursuing unique paths to treatment and ultimately a cure for Fragile X. This year has seen burgeoning international collaborations, which are funding brilliant ideas and turning those ideas into actual potential treatments for Andy and his peers. And so today I'm optimistic about Andy's future. When you've heard what these speakers have to say, I think you'll be optimistic too. They have found so many different independent approaches to solving Fragile X. When just one of them succeeds, think of the lives that will change. So thank you for joining us today. Fragile X syndrome is the most common inherited form of intellectual disability as well as the leading monogenic cause of autism. With the discovery of FMR1 gene silencing as the cause of Fragile X, we have seen extensive investigations both in pathophysiological and clinical aspects. Where are we now in exploring effective treatments for Fragile X syndrome? Where could be the next breakthroughs? And what lessons learned that are applicable to other rare diseases? Happy World Fragile X Day to everyone. I want to thank you all for joining us today to commemorate this very special occasion. Peter, this is really a remarkable time to be a neuroscience researcher, especially in the field of developmental disorders, rare diseases, and particularly Fragile X. You've led the way in studying and comparing different single gene causes of autism. What has you most excited right now? Well, I think over the last 10 years, the, we've really defined the genetic landscape um, by, that leads to at least the monogenic forms of the neurodevelopmental disorders. And we now know that they cluster around sort of subcategories of gene function. Um, and we know there's anywhere between 200 and 1,000 genes that can lead to neurodevelopmental disorders like autism and intellectual disability. And that arms researchers with the tools to make animal models. And genetics has also gone a long way that we can make any model we want to now. We have human stem cell models, we have rodent models, we have large animal models, and we can really address questions that were never achievable before. If you combine that with the new techniques for being able to understand brain circuits, where we can delete a gene in a specific particular cell type or in a particular cell region, we can really now start to define the pathophysiology associated with these disorders. And armed with that, we can ask much more fundamental questions about what's going um, awry in the brain in the absence of a particular gene. So it's a really exciting time to properly define these disorders in terms of how they affect the brain and also ask questions of when can we ameliorate the, the pathophysiology. So it's a phenomenal time to be a neuroscientist working in this field. Liz, this seems to be a very busy time for clinical trials in Fragile X. Yeah, it's very busy. We have um, quite a few um, different industry partners that are looking at different targets. And uh, so we're, we're working hard to figure out what are the best ways to go. And I think in the Fragile X world, we've had, um, we've had some failed trials in the past um, because we were really the first condition that went toward trying to target treatment of the underlying disorder and sort of fix the brain and fix the actual condition itself rather than just using supportive treatments. And so we learned a lot during those trials about um, problems um, that we had with the models that were being used at that, at, at that time, really 10, 13 years ago even. 
we've made a lot of progress on on uh, new ways of approaching these trials that hopefully will allow some of the agents that are going forward right now to be more successful. Well, things certainly have progressed since the early days of Fragile X clinical trials. And I think you deserve a lot of the credit for that, Liz. What would you say is the state of the art for clinical trials methodology in Fragile X? And, and just to extend that, what can other rare diseases learn from this progress? Yeah, so I think we've learned um, that you can't just, you know, take any outcome measure from autism and use it in Fragile X. And we've learned a little bit about what patient populations we can use. And I think one of the things we've learned is that the mouse, the, the mouse model in particular, um, is very easy to treat. And we can see improvements in the mouse model easily, but then that's very hard to translate to people um, due to the variability of, of the condition in people and the heterogeneity of their background and the heterogeneity of, of where they live and what they do. And so the variability makes it challenging to use measures that you know have a lot of variability themselves. And so we've done a lot of work to find objective measures that are gonna look at the Fragile X condition better. Things like cognitive measures, like the NIH toolbox that we've now spent about eight years validating for intellectual disability and particularly for Fragile X. Um, things like um, EEG that we can measure, you know, circuit activity or, or brain responses to sound, for instance, that maybe that those are not kinds of things that we can get a drug approved on, um, but they are the kinds of things that can give us an indication that we have a signal so we know which drugs to move forward. And, and we don't know that circuits and um, different neurotransmitter mechanisms and so forth are gonna behave exactly the same in the mouse and the human. But if we have ways of moving forward into humans where we do, um, where we have some sort of directly translatable markers like an EEG finding that's the same in the mouse and the human, and we can show that a drug targets this exactly the same way in a mouse and a human, then that makes that a little more translatable to humans than some of the other mouse behaviors we've been relying on. Um, and also, um, we, we are now thinking that, you know, we get data in a model organism and that's great. We really want to have that data to be able to show that uh, a drug looks promising, but we've changed our thinking that you, you don't just go into a big trial. You need to do a, an early phase trial where we look at a lot of objective measures and demonstrate that we can see a signal. And if we can't see a signal in, in a trial where we've looked at, um, where we've looked at what the drug does in a smaller number of patients with objective measures that have less placebo effect, then we may not want to use patient resources to do a large trial of that agent. And I think the strategy of doing a small trial with kind of intensive use of different measures to prove that there's a signal has actually been um, fairly successful over the recent years. And I think we'll see more successes with that um, as we go forward. It is really fascinating to think that you can use human electrophysiology to actually get a glimpse of what's going on in the brain. That, that seems like a really powerful tool. What are the specific things that you're looking at when you look at human electrophysiology? So we're looking at both at EEG and something called ERP, which is event-related potentials. And so, um, in Fragile X, we look at event-related potentials, mainly related to, to sound. And that's because patients with Fragile X have an extreme sensitivity to sound in many cases. And when you actually measure their response to sound in the brain, they have a bigger response than, would, than you would see in a control person of the same age. And so we can measure this excessive response to sound. We can, there are a lot of characteristics about sound processing surrounding that that we can measure. And then there's an EEG background. There's something called gamma power, which is just a certain frequency of, of uh, EEG activity that is increased in Fragile X. And so we've been able to see in the mouse model that the gamma power is abnormal, just like in the people. And we've been able to see in the mouse model when we use really good detailed EEG that is um, that uses multiple leads and not just you know a couple leads on the mouse head. When we really look at the mouse EEG, we can see the same kinds of abnormal processing of sound in the mouse model as well. So if we have an agent that changes those things in the mouse, then 
we can expect, and then we can immediately go and check and see, does that agent change the same thing in a person? And then um, what we really need to do, so this is work that we don't quite have done yet. What we really need to do is be able to hook up those EEG changes to clinical phenotypes and show that like when you change gamma power, you get less anxiety or something like that. Or when you change novel sound processing, you get better language. Um, but we aren't, we aren't there yet and there's ongoing work in that direction that, that hopefully will help us in the future with seeing these EEG changes and knowing then what should we measure clinically that will be clinically meaningful. So there, there's still a need to validate some of these electrophysiological methods and to see if they correlate with clinical improvement. But is there a sense that some of these electrophysiologic tests will actually normalize with treatment? Have we seen responses to drug treatment that actually involve changes in electrophysiology. Yeah, I mean, there's, there are several examples of that. Craig Erickson is running an NIH funded project where they're looking at changes after a single dose of different agents. And they have seen that some of the agents that they have used have changed the electrophysiology. And we ran a, a trial of a um, phosphodiesterase inhibitor, a PDE4D inhibitor, recently a phase two study, which actually showed that you could change the abnormal, the excessive sound sensitivity in the patients with the drug. And so that's a, that's a very strong finding, particularly when in that study, it was coupled with a change in cognitive performance on the NIH toolbox, which is another objective performance-based measure. And the parents reported that the patients were better. So this was a small intensive, you know, let's look and see if there's a signal kind of study. And this is an example of the kind of study that we need to, to do. So now we know we had a, we have a great, early signal. And so hopefully that will predict better results in phase three trials than what we've had in the past. That really does seem clinically relevant. And it really does seem relevant to quality of life as well. So that's very exciting. Yeah. Peter, uh, one of the questions that I hear people ask most often is how treatable developmental disorders in general might be later in life and specifically how treatable Fragile X might be at later stages of life. Now, you've been a leader in this field in studying development in Fragile X and a lot of other monogenic causes of autism. Um, what's your take on this? How reversible is this later in life? Well, that's the $6 million question. I mean, Adrian Bird really changed the landscape with, and, and the work of Voodoo Zogby as well, showing that Rett syndrome the, when MECP2, the gene that's altered in Rett syndrome, is um, re-expressed late in life or knocked down late in life, you can either, in the first case, you can rescue many of the phenotypes associated with in the, in the rodent models. Um, and if you knock it out late in life, you can recapitulate any of those, the features of Rett syndrome, which argued that there isn't a critical period for MECP2 re-expression or Rett syndrome. Now, whether that's true for numerous other disorders, um, we need to be tested and it is being tested for many disorders, but it's one of the central questions we're asking um, in my lab and, and in the center that I work in and other labs around the world are asking. But I think the most likely outcome of all of this, our prediction, if you will, is that certain models will be more or less amenable to gene re-expression late in life, and we, and we don't know. And the key question there, I think as well, is it's unlikely to rescue everything when you express late in life. There's different critical periods. There isn't a single critical period. So certain features might be more amenable to um, genetic re-expression. Um, other features might be less amenable to that, and we won't know until we try. The other key aspect to that, I think, Mike, is that we're talking, these are largely being tested with genetic re-expression, but even if genetic re-expression has a critical period and you can't rescue certain features of fragile X syndrome, for example, that does not mean they're not amenable to other types of therapies. Pharmaceutical therapies might work on the circuit, which is still amenable to treatment, even though changing the root cause, i.e. the loss of FMRP, um, is no longer amenable to just re-expressing it. So I think there's lots of different critical periods. 
Um, different features will have different critical periods, different treatments will have different critical periods, and that's really important. And that's why we need just a lot more research into all of these different monogenic forms, including fragile X. Huge advantage for rare diseases, for monogenic diseases, um, for a lot of the, the things that you're studying, the single gene causes of autism. And this is a huge advantage when it comes to drug discovery and development of new therapeutics. It, it really is amazingly powerful. It is, and we talk about the rare diseases, but if you combine all the different um, rare diseases together, you end up with a disorder state that is not that rare. It affects well over 10% of the population. So this is, it's crucial that we understand these and especially how similar they are. And if we can cluster them together for therapeutic purposes. So what research still needs to be done to understand development and its role in these neurodevelopmental disorders? Yeah, so we're, what we're trying to do is cluster the, um, the different monogenic forms of autism and intellectual disability, not just in terms of commonalities in the biochemical pathways that might be affected, but commonalities of timing of when the brain circuits start to change and to really identify, um, to cluster them based on developmental windows. And one of the things we found recently was if we treat early in life, just transiently, we can rescue some of the um, issues in our models of fragile X syndrome that we can remove the treatment and we've rescued that particular stage of development. And, I, and other people are starting to find the same things for other aspects of fragile X. So I think that's actually a really key question that's never been um, thoroughly addressed, is are there windows that if we can treat during those windows, we can get good permanent recovery? Um, and I think that's a really interesting question, again, about critical periods that we really need to understand more deeply. Very exciting. Liz, I guess I should ask you the same question um, about what work remains to be done in the clinical trials field because we've come a long way, but we're not totally done yet, I assume. Yeah, uh, we have a great deal of work to do in the clinical trials field. <laughs> I mean, we always lag by, you know, 10 years or so, the basic science people in figuring out how to translate people think to things to people because it's just so challenging. But I would say that the work that needs to be done is, I mean, I think Peter's idea of critical windows is very important. And we in clinic have always thought that combinations of medications would be needed to really fully fix Fragile X because the FMRP has so many roles and it may have different roles at different times in life. And there may be certain things that work when you're young and certain things that work better when you're older, as Peter was mentioning. Um, and there may be things that work together, but uh, to, in order to have that kind of treatment, we have to get our foot in the door. The reason cancer has so many good treatments and why they can add drugs onto other drugs is that um, you know, they got drugs approved at the beginning and you can only test combinations in general after something is approved. Although um, we are doing some new study designs to try to test combinations of, of medications. And I, I think um, it's important to develop that. So that's an area of clinical science that we need to develop. But traditionally, you have to get approvals of one thing and then you can, then you can treat a patient with an additional medication that's investigational. So um, trial designs for, for combinations. Um, we need to get, we, we've done a lot of work on outcome measures, but at this point, we don't yet have them, we don't yet have the FDA considering them, quote, fit for purpose. And this is work we need to do with the FDA so that we can um, generate outcome measures that index the phenotypes in Fragile X and index the important things to families in Fragile X well, um, in addition to giving us good objective performance-based measures in order to move drugs forward. So we need, we have a lot of validation yet to do, even on the things that we've already done work on. Um, and, and so I, I really see us as um, needing to continue to improve our clinical trial science. We've collected 
in the recent years, a fair amount of well vetted natural history where we can actually see the trajectory of fragile X, of, of typical fragile X with just standard of care treatment. Uh, what do patients with fragile X do over time in terms of their development based on different measures? And, and we need to have more of that because if we had a gene therapy, we, we certainly wouldn't expect all the effects to occur in, a, in, the, in the context of like a three month trial. We'd need to be able to look and see what did that gene therapy do across life and to be able to understand that we have to have these very good natural history studies where we understand what does fragile x actually look look at across life on measures that we can use to demonstrate you know what is the gene therapy or what is another drug doing and so that's that's you know, early in its collection, we have a new project with the CDC where we're going to collect 600 data on 600 patients that will be across um, the pediatric age span, really, from about 5 to 23, which is going to give us very nice data on how does Fragile X evolve. We've already collected some data through my Neuronext trial and through an earlier CDC project. And so I think we're really, we have a lot of building blocks to get to the place where we have this multiple therapy treatment that we really need. And right now we're in the midst of, of building building the building, so to speak. We're, we're just putting more bricks in the wall every year as we get that basic database that feels like cancer already have that we can use to, to really get um, treatments approved and to improve people's lives. It does seem like the validation of these clinical endpoints is a real catch-22. It's, it's really even kind of a whole series of catch-22s because you, know, you have to correlate one thing with another thing, which correlates with quality of life, but then you have to show that it, it moves with treatment. But if it, for it to move with treatment, you have to have a treatment that works. And yeah. then you have to just repeat this cycle over and over again. Um, so where are we in that whole process? It feels like we're, we're well on the path, but we, we're yeah. still on the path. We're not there yet. Yeah, we're on the path. It's a, it's a challenge because, yes, we have to show that we can do the measure in Fragile X and that it's reproducible and then that the measures have content validity and, and the standard things you would do to validate a test. But then we have to show how much change on the measure is clinically meaningful. And to do that, we have to use... Um, interviews of families and other kinds of measures where families rate how much improvement they're seeing in the patient and whether that's a clinically meaningful improvement. So we are actually, uh, with NIH Toolbox and, and some of our family-based um, report measures of things like the biggest problem that, that they, like we have them just pick their biggest problem and then rate it on a scale. Um, we're, we're, we're in active discussion with FDA on what we need to do to get those measures fit, fit for purpose. And in the upcoming trials, there will be a lot of work toward um, providing FDA what they need to make these measures be, um, be what we need to, to get um, drugs approved. So uh, it's an ongoing effort and it really involves an interplay between um, us doing scientific validation on a measure and then going back to the families and asking them, well, if this measure changes this much and it, it corresponds to sort of this change in, in what your child can do, do you consider that a clinically meaningful change? And so um, the FDA is very focused on that right now, and, and that's work that is actively going on in the upcoming trials. So we're going to have each, you know, each sort of two or three year period, we get more information on how to best move these forward. But, but yes, it's, it's a challenge, <laughs> but we're, we're hitting it head on. Well, here's a question for both of you, each of you. Uh, I want you to look into your crystal balls and to tell me where you see us in five years or in 10 years. Peter, where are we heading? Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, for all the reasons I said earlier on, I think the future's bright. And from a, from a fundamental research point of view, I think we're getting far better with our uh, models of these disorders in order to get real predictive validity. I mean, that's a holy grail. If we can see a particular therapy having a beneficial effect in our animal models so that will be predictive of what's happening, uh, what happens in the clinic. And we have to get a lot better um, and, uh, at the research level in making our models predictive. We need to understand our models better. We need to ask the model um, 
we need to use our models in the appropriate way. And I think we're getting far better at that um, as, as scientists. So from that point of view, I'm very hopeful. I think we're, we are gonna have good predictive validity. We need a drug that we know or a treatment that we know works well in humans to test predictive validity um, in our animal models. And I'm, I'm really excited about the PDE4 that this might give us that opportunity. Um, but, but yeah, with all of the new techniques we have, with all of the new knowledge we have, I think the future is very bright for coming up with um, therapies that are predictive in our animal models for the clinic. And Liz, what is it that excites you about the, the future five years or 10 years? Yeah, so I think we're turning a corner and we know now that there are genetically based um, therapies in development for Fragile X, as well as small molecules. And it may be that these strategies will actually work best together or different things will work better at different ages. Um, and so we need to proceed ahead with all of that. And so I would, in five to 10 years, I mean, I think we're just getting trial designs really under our belt. And I would hope that in that period of time, we have that initial drug approved so we can start adding things on. We're in the midst of doing gene therapy trials. We've got a process figured out for sort of fast fail where we can look at animal data, move that into humans and in kind of a standardized um, approach to do a very, you know, a, a small focused trial, figure out does the drug work and move on to a new target if it doesn't really seem to have an impact in humans. So I, and, and that's the way we're gonna get to those combination therapies that we want. And, and so I, I think we have a lot of positivity going right now. I think we're moving into some big, exciting trials and um, hopefully those will be more successful in the past. And I would hope that in five to 10 years, um, we've got at least one drug approved and we're working on getting those add-on therapies and we're moving actual genetic therapies like gene therapy into the clinic. Well, it is a really exciting time and it's a really hopeful time. And there really is this sense that everything is coalescing, that finally all the pieces are coming together. And I, I just really wanna thank both of you for being here and happy Fragile X Day. Yeah, happy Fragile happy, X Day. Happy Fragile X Day to everyone. The clinical intervention of Fragile X Syndrome has largely focused on symptomatic treatment of psychiatric and behavioral problems, yet to eradicating the disease. We need to tackle underlying causes. What are the current approaches targeting the root causes of this inherited disorder? Will they be the game changers we need in the fight against Fragile X? Jeannie, what sparked your interest in Fragile X technologies? I've been interested in Fragile X for a very long time. First, as a PhD student um, at the University of Pennsylvania, where, where I trained as a physician scientist. And there, my PhD work was directed at understanding the, this unusual inheritance pattern for Fragile X. And um, of course, this was back before there were trinucleotide repeats and before FMR1. What really caught my attention as a student was the fact that the syndrome can only be passed through the maternal lineage, which was very odd. And it had all the markings of an imprinted disorder. And in fact, Fragile X is an imprinted disorder, meaning that the parent of origin has an effect on the gene. And um, this unusual pattern of inheritance and the fact that it's X-linked is um, actually what led me to X chromosome inactivation, which has been my lab's main focus for the past 20 plus years. And as we've gotten a better understanding of the basic mechanisms behind X inactivation, we've become interested in leveraging that understanding towards treating X-linked diseases. And uh, those diseases would include uh, not only Rett syndrome, which is something we've been studying for 10 years, but also Fragile X syndrome, which you know, brings me back full circle to, to my PhD work. And so um, these past 10 years or so, we've been working on two technologies to address um, the uh, the, the symptoms in Fragile X syndrome. Um, and, and both of these technologies, well, one is, one is more specific for Fragile X and the other is uh, something that could be applied to a number of different X-linked diseases. And so, so yes, I've been interested mm -hmm. in developing Fragile X uh, therapies for probably three decades at this point. 
So what is the approach that you're working on and how does it differ from existing treatments for Fragile X syndrome? I mentioned that there were two technologies. Um, they're actually very different. They're focused on different targets. So the, the first one is what we called uh, a selective X chromosome reactivation. And I should mention that this is a technology that uh, we envision working in um, girls with fragile X syndrome, as well as girls with um, other, other excellent diseases. And I can say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But the other, uh, the other technology is much more specific for FMR1. Um, so we call it FMR1 reactivation. And this one can be applied, if it's ever successful, can be applied to both boys and girls because it selectively addresses the mutant copy of the causal gene, which is FMR1. And um, so, so you ask the question, how do they differ from existing technologies and uh, existing medicines? And um, well, the reason we're excited about these technologies is because um, they really target the root cause of um, fragile X. Uh, which, as you know, um, is the absence of FMRP, which is the protein product of um, the gene FMR1. So unlike um, the currently available treatments, we're not um, targeting just the symptoms or individual symptoms mm -hmm. of fragile X. We're actually getting at what is responsible for these constellation, uh, constellations of symptoms um, to begin with. So can you explain what the X reactivation technology actually involves, Jeannie? Yeah, um, so, um, right, so, so there's X reactivation. Um, and so this stems from a realization that we and others had, you know, going back many years now, which is that girls with fragile X syndrome and other X-linked diseases uh, actually have the cure within their own cells. Now that sounds a little bit odd until um, you realize that, so girls have two X chromosomes, um, whereas boys have one X chromosome. And so it happens that in order to equalize the gene expression from you know, two versus one, the girls inactivate uh, one of their X chromosomes in early development, uh, before birth, long before birth. And so what this means is that girls and, and women in general will carry around an extra X chromosome their entire lives in a dormant state. So it's not utilized at all. We just carry it around like a, you know, extra baggage. But, but since that chromosome has a lot of good genes, you know, it occurred to us and others that uh, we could potentially utilize, maybe turn back on some of those good genes on the inactive X to treat the disorder that is caused by the bad gene on the expressing uh, X chromosome. And so FMR1, as you know, is on the X chromosome uh, and girls have two copies of it, boys have one copy. So we have now discovered a way to unlock uh, the, the dormant FMR1 gene on the inactive X chromosome. And um, we do that without getting too technical here. We do that by targeting a non-coding RNA called EXIST with an antisense oligonucleotide. So it's a very short nucleic acid. Um, and that interrupts the ability of EXIST RNA to uh, maintain X chromosome inactivation. So we now have a proof of concept in cells and in animals that we can get this to work and restore, partially restore, not fully restore, but partially restore mm -hmm. expression of these genes by few percent to maybe 20%, which we believe can be therapeutic. And so mm -hmm. um, the other really exciting thing about this is that the treatment would only have to be given two or three times a year, right? So the families would show up with their children and, and uh, go to the hospital two or three times a year to get a booster shot. And hopefully that would last, you know, for another four to six months. So um, if, if this ever became a therapy and we're hopeful that it could, um, I think it would be a game changer for families. So for parents of children who have Fragile X syndrome, um, what do you think the Fragile X treatment landscape will look like for them and their children in 10 years time? Right. So, um, 
I think, you know, biotechnology is progressing at a rapid pace. I think that the treatment landscape uh, will continue to evolve at a very rapid pace over the next mm. five uh, to 10 years. So uh, as you know, there's a very healthy pipeline of medicines that are already in the mm. clinic, right? And um, these medicines are important because they treat um, the different symptoms associated with fragile X syndrome, you know, the autism, the, um, the anxiety, the seizures, if, uh, mm. if they're present in, in the girls and the boys, muscle spasm, I mean, a lot of things. I think it's very important to have better and more uh, types of treatments um, for, for these symptoms. Um, and so I, I see a lot of that coming through in the next five years or so. Um, ultimately, though, I think we want to try to get at the root cause, right? Because by treating the absence of FMRP or FMR1, absence of its expression, um, we will have the best chance of hitting all of these symptoms at once and not having to, mm -hmm. you know, have go to, to, to have this situation of being in a polypharmacy where you have to take four or five different medicines, mm -hmm. you know, a day in order to alleviate all of the suffering. So I think if we can project out to five or 10 years, 15, whatever, years from now, we're gonna be looking at different ways to uh, restore FMR1 expression. And so perhaps, you know, we might see something in five years because we are hopeful about the X reactivation technology. Um, there's another technology I haven't mentioned, which I think will be equally important. That's the area of gene therapy. Various challenges associated with the AAV delivery, you know, the viral delivery. There's, uh, there are issues with um, uh, overexpression of the genes which are introduced and how many cells in the brain that you can, that you can hit. Um, but I think that in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see tremendous progress in that, in that space as well. Thank you, Ginny. Thank you very much for your time. The silencing of the FMR1 gene and consequent lack of FMRP protein is the major contribution to the pathophysiology of Fragile X syndrome. With the advancement in gene therapy, gene reactivation and protein replacement, we may really be able to target the root causes of this disease. We are delighted to showcase several innovators at the front line of these approaches and their progresses. My lab is an engineering lab and we work on drug delivery, which involves taking different types of medicines or drugs to the place where they're needed inside of the body. My lab has been working on a type of therapy called messenger RNA or mRNA therapy uh, for over a decade now. And one of the things that really interests us is figuring out how the chemistry of the nanoparticles that we put this RNA inside, how that chemistry affects where they go inside of the body. Uh, because if we can design these nanoparticles to take the mRNA to different types of tissues, we would then have the opportunity to do types of gene therapy in those tissues. So for Fragile X syndrome, we know that there is a problematic protein associated with that disease, FMRP. And we were thinking that if we deliver messenger RNA into these cells, uh, into brain cells, we might be able to correct or make up for uh, the problems in that gene that uh, contribute to the disease and its progression. The major progress we've made is being able to optimize our nanoparticle chemistry to take messenger RNA into many types of cells within the brain and to be able to do it in a way where we can access almost the entire brain. There are some delivery systems where the locations within the brain are limited or you can only deliver to certain cell types. So we're excited that we're in a position to really look at the influence of these genes uh, throughout the entire brain in Fragile X patients. 
Our approach in the gene therapy work entails the use of a type of molecule called a shuttle vector to transfer the recombinant protein into the brain. The basic strategy is called gene replacement therapy because the viral genome contains the mouse or human DNA sequence encoding FMRP, the protein that is missing in Fragile X syndrome. These experiments employ the mouse and rat models of the disorder and a specific type of virus called adeno-associated virus or AAV. The recombinant versions of these AAVs used in both preclinical studies and in human clinical trials are both non-replicating and non-pathogenic viruses. We have made substantial progress over the past several years. The data from our published studies demonstrates partial reversal of the Fragile X phenotype in both the mouse and rat models of the disorder. Our current work is devoted towards testing new AAV constructs, that is, new versions of AAV FMRP, testing new drug administration procedures, and exploring new modes of probing AAV FMRP efficacy in the animal models. As one example of the latter, that is probing the efficacy of the treatment, we are using electroencephalography or EEG to record spontaneous electrical activity in the brain. This type of analysis would be directly applicable to a human clinical trial. The approach uh, we have taken is based on the identification uh, by, by Dr. Hervé Moine, our collaborator from the IGBMC, of uh, this enzyme DGKK as the most proximal messenger RNA target of FMRP in neurons. The absence of FMRP leads to the absence of DGKK, and uh, this and the latter mimics the effect of FMR1 knockdown, both in vitro and in vivo. Uh, so, so to tackle this problem, we constructed an AAV that carries an FMRP independent variant of DGKK. And we administered this vector directly into the brain of FMR1 knockout mice, which are, uh, uh, of course, a well-known animal model of fragile X syndrome. And when we did this, it led to the correction of all behavioral abnormalities observed in the knockout mice relative to healthy wild-type mice. Uh, also, treatment with this AAV was not associated with any overtoxicity in the mice. These findings were recently published in Embo Molecular Medicine. And we believe, uh, on the basis of these findings, that gene therapy with DGKK holds considerable promise as a treatment option for Fragile X. And we are currently performing additional non-clinical studies to advance this candidate therapy into the clinic. In terms of my focus, in terms of Fragile X research, I think about it in two ways. One is both understanding the physiology of how the brain works in Fragile X, but as a physician, I feel as one of my callings is to think about innovative uh, treatments in Fragile X. And in, in my case, those tend to be in a few different arenas. Uh, we've put together a team here of basic scientists, clinical scientists, psychologists, um, different types of interdisciplinary specialties to really understand um, what something like a protein replacement uh, therapy in Fragile X would look like and understanding how to put that together in both the safest and the best way possible. Um, we've began working primarily in animal models to understand um, how, how we're placing uh, the Fragile X protein in the mouse will affect both behavior and other aspects of of of, um, of the mouse phenotype you know when we think about now when it comes to the application of humans how do we think about that you know one example i'll give is that when you think about fragile x in nature you think about uh, different individuals with different uh, different amounts of protein depending on their mutation status and with different amounts of protein uh, you can have different strengths and weaknesses and so when we think about fragile x gene therapy you know this is not to me considered a, a curative therapy but rather one where would, would adding protein to an existing system help augment and help enhance some behaviors um, that, 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 that could make it um, uh, primarily uh, something that would, that would really shift the, the, the needle in terms of quality of life or cognition, um, emotional regulation. You know? So those are, I think, some very exciting avenues as we think about um, the modern era of potential protein replacement in Fragile X.
Over the past two decades, our scientists and clinicians have learned tremendously from the clinical development of targeted therapy to change the course of Fragile X syndrome. What have our past experiences taught us? What are still the main obstacles? How can we fully deliver the potential of targeted therapy? Craig, I was reflecting this morning and I, it occurred to me that it's uh, now the 20th anniversary of the paper that Kim Huber and I published suggesting the outlandish possibility that there might be uh, the potential for a small molecule therapy to change the course of a fragile X syndrome. Um, and uh, it's been quite a, quite a ride the last 20 years. Uh, a lot of uh, high hopes and some of them have been dashed. Um, but um, I feel like we're actually in a, in a really good place to, uh, you know, accomplish our mission um, sooner rather than later. Yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoyed uh, joining that ride where I came from the uh, autism field where, you know, uh, no single gene disorders, no clear leads, massive heterogeneity and moving into Fragile X with the concept of, being able to conduct animal studies, to do bench lab studies, and then truly translate those findings in, into human work. And we've learned a heck of a lot in the last two decades. And, you know, in my mind, we think a lot about failed trials, but every quote failure is a lesson learned. And, you know, overall, our lab and, and our human work is really focused now on Fragile X is one condition, but how do we define variation molecularly, electrophysiologically, functionally, and then match individuals with treatment? Yeah, I completely agree with you. When we started, um, there's very little experience in um, running clinical trials, uh, and certainly not to the standard that would be required by the FDA, and, and so many unknowns um, that occur with any drug development program, like What's the right target? What's the right compound? What's the right dose? Um, are there going to be dose limiting side effects that we have to take into consideration? Who are the correct patients? What are the right endpoints to measure? But I, I completely agree with what you're saying is that every time we do a trial, we learn something new um, and we apply that knowledge. So it's very iterative. And I, I actually share your, your optimism that um, we have learned enough now to actually deliver um, in, in the near term. So in our lab and other labs, high density electrophysiology or brain electrical activity and what are small molecules doing early in phase one and phase two studies to see target engagement. And we've really moved away from a reliance on pen and paper measures. Now, we think that's huge and will allow us to truly link preclinical uh, to clinical outcomes. But, you know, even that is, has taken a lot of time. And again, you know, e hindsight is twenty twenty, and I don't think they're, view we don't view it as setbacks, but it's really a new generation and a new iteration of trial approaches that are more tightly linked to animal experiments. Yeah, I, 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 I hear you. I mean, I think that um, there's a lot of flying blind, use another a flight uh, metaphor, but um. You know, if you don't know, uh, you don't have a good biomarker of target engagement, then you're, it's a lot of guesswork um, to know, like, what's the right dose? Um, it, does the uh, therapeutic effect persist or is there a development of acquired treatment resistance, which it turns out to be a potential problem? And that knowledge would give you so much confidence to say, for example, in the case of your work, there's an electrophysiological signature of altered function. Um, and this signature can be modified by a treatment and you can learn the, you know, what is the correct dose to move that biomarker from the beginning. Fragile X could be viewed, at least some aspects, as a metabolic brain disease uh, to the extent that it's a dysregulated protein synthesis um, in neurons. And of course, we now understand that um, that's a process a pathophysiological process that contributes to some symptoms. Um, there are other pathophysiological processes like altered um, ion channel function, particularly potassium channel function, and still other features that are due to altered, simply altered brain development. The, the wiring diagram is, is different. And so we would not expect one treatment to hit all of those three causes of dysfunction 
uh, in Fragile X and having some insight uh, from a biomarker on, you know, what what symptoms line up best with what treatment strategies would be super helpful. Um, Because, you know, you could have a fantastic treatment, but you're measuring the wrong thing. And I think that has been some of the clinical experience, which is very frustrating um, to the clinicians and the families. Um, So, And not to mention layering development into that, where we think about treating, you know, from newborns to toddlers to adolescents to adults and, you know, where your treatment windows there are. So, you know, when we when we hear of positive leads in preclinical, you know, data, and we take that into human studies, I think, you know, we've definitely sharpened our tools in quantitative ways, but we also have to look at developmental windows and cohorts maybe being different. And the idea that if we have to study something in adults first and we do signal finding, then we're systematically moving through the ages. We're thinking about males and females differently. So they're both represented. We want to represent everyone. But if we don't control our studies to be able to power and think about subgroups with signal detection, I think we're just we're doomed to fail. Yeah, I, I, that is a really good point. Also, then I'm also struck very strong. <laughs> amazed actually by the work that came out of Peter Kine's lab in Edinburgh, where they found that timely treatment during development could lead to an improvement that persisted for many, many months um, in the absence of continual treatment. Like it was intervening at the right moment in development could alter the course of brain development in a, in a very effective way to help a long-term outcome. So, you know, I, I really agree with you, Craig, that like uh, we have learned so much and um, I feel that we really are in the threshold of being able to apply this knowledge to develop some medicines that are going to help. I feel like we're finally at the honest point where we interface with treatment developers, you know, around the world where we can take a small molecule, a combination of small molecules in our hands, use all the tools that we've developed to detect signal in a meaningful way. And what's really surprised me in the last five years through our work with single dose challenge studies, phase 1A designs with 10 to 24 patients, that it doesn't take huge samples to detect signal when you're using electrophysiology, when you're using computer-based testing, which I think is really great for anyone that thinks about drug development in this field because your ability to make go-no-go decisions using quantitative measures, and then de-risk your phase two and phase three programs once you have a sense of who the responders are quantitatively, really just opens the field up in ways that we've not had before, where companies and other developers faced funding large phase two programs with heterogeneous samples, males and females, mosaics, non-mosaics. We're just not in that place anymore because of our tool development, because what we've learned and about how we've improved our linkages to preclinical studies. I mean, a lot of folks now can do preclinical fMR1 knockout mouse electrophysiologic studies, see what their compounds are doing in the mouse, then immediately move into a 1B target engagement study in humans, see if there's synchrony and see which humans are responding, even with small subgroups, because we don't have placebo response with those measures in different ways. So we're, we're very excited about that. And, you know, despite all the quote failures, we're more excited in our lab than, than I've ever been in my career because these tools are really poised for success because of, as you said, Mark, everything we've learned from the past. Yeah, it's been really gratifying to see um, that sort of these small new um, clinical candidates keep being introduced. And I think your point is, re- is also very well taken, which is that we, with a, with a, uh, a rare um, disease like fragile X, we don't have the luxury of, of, um, you know, endless attempts to succeed because, um, you know, eh, clinical trials are so expensive um, that it's not like a huge indication, like major depressive disorder or schizophrenia um, where you just you keep your Alzheimer's disease, where you just keep um, throwing things at the wall in the hopes that something sticks. We don't have that luxury in Fragile X. So the more informed we can be going into doing the study, 
um, the more likely we are going to be to succeed. So thank you <laughs> for advancing the field in that way, Craig. Yeah, and I think it's important for us as, you know, human and translational scientists, you know, we use what we learn, from example, our NIH studies to inform our treatment development. Uh, you know, another feature of Fragile X that always impressed me from the beginning was the evolutionary conservation of some of the pathophysiological mechanisms, literally, literally from fruit flies through mice and rats um, and humans. And so... There is every, uh, I'm, a, I'm very bullish. I mean, perhaps because I'm a basic scientist at heart, but I'm, <laughs> I do, I'm a firm believer in the relevance of the animal models, particularly in a genetically defined disease such as Fragile X. And, and we think about who, who with Fragile X is best modeled by the available preclinical model. So if it's a knockout mouse, who is best modeled? When we do human high density EEG and we look at an individual signal, is that a signal that matches? the electrophysiologic pathophysiology we see in the mouse or not? Is that someone who is going to be best modeled? That's how we think about it now. There's still great utility, but obviously it's not an exact replica of the human experience across the board. Yeah, I think that's that's cool. And then the, then the question will become, um, what is the best behavioral correlate um, or maladaptive behavioral correlate of the electrophysiological signature, because then that gets you closer to the quality of life objective. But I would say also on the human side of saying you have an altered EEG signature, what major behavioral domain does that correlate with? You know, is it irritability, aggression, and so on and so forth? Um, and that's that's another you know objective or or um, challenge that we have. Not to mention thinking about anxiety, which we all believe is a core lifelong feature, but very difficult to measure. And we're putting a lot of effort in collaboratively across human labs to think about anxiety more objectively and more consistently because we get regulatory feedback of this is a developmental disorder. People can't self-report anxiety. So how do you yeah. measure it? But it's so important to the phenotype. So that's something we really have to sharpen tools in that area to have a chance to think of it as a target because we all know clinically that if you significantly reduce anxiety, quality of life and function comes with it. But if we can't define it in a logical, consistent manner, you know, how do we use it? Yeah, I think um, we still have obstacles to clear um, to go from where we are today to getting a medicine approved. And of course, one of those is... Um, is the continual um, need to educate the FDA and the regulatory authorities um, on, uh, well, the urgent need and, and the very fact that it, it won't be one size fits all. In my last 15 years interfacing with the FDA, I think they're better positioned now to understand variation in Fragile X, understanding these quantitative measures we discussed, not that they're going to be primary approvable outcomes, but they can have utility in defining subgroups and understanding at a regulatory level that, yes, you can have an indication for some individuals with a single gene disorder, and that's okay if you're defining them appropriately. So I, I think that backdrop is going to be key to enabling everything you know we've discussed well let's hope that uh, we can close the deal in the near future i think we're getting close this was super enjoyable mark really enjoyed the discussion there has been growing excitement in the fragile x research community about new developments in targeted treatments for fragile x let's hear from our leading experts about some productive approaches what are the innovative targets and pathways that these researchers are going after? How can Fragile X patients potentially benefit from their progress? So Neuropharmaceuticals is developing Zen002, a pharmaceutically produced non-plant-derived cannabidiol transdermal gel for the treatment of behavioral symptoms in Fragile X syndrome. We believe Zen002 is unique and that it may reverse a dysfunction of the endocannabinoid system found in individuals with Fragile X syndrome. That dysfunction may lead to the loss of synaptic plasticity and the emotional responsivity that's seen in kids with Fragile X syndrome. Zen002 is also unique in that it's absorbed through the skin and it may be a good alternative for children who cannot take oral medications. Zen002 may also cause less GI side effects or gastrointestinal side effects 
And it also may avoid some issues with liver function as it doesn't get metabolized through first pass metabolism in the liver. In regards to our progress with Zen002, we've completed our first trial, ConnectFX, in Fragile X and found that Zen002 was well tolerated and it provided a clinically meaningful change and improvement in social avoidance in children with Fragile X and those children specifically with at least 90% methylation of their FMR1 gene. Our next milestone is to complete our ongoing confirmatory phase three trial called ReConnect and then file for regulatory approval if the results are positive. Our approach is really a um, small molecule development. So this is a novel chemical entity. This is a small molecule. Uh, we call it NLX101. Um, and it's uh, a compound which had already undergone uh, extensive in investigation for um, properties which are antidepressant properties and pro-cognitive activity. Um, so, so this um, small molecule targets the serotonin system. Now, now, serotonin is a neurotransmitter in the brain which is known to be involved in a multiplicity of different uh, uh, brain functions and uh, also in autism disorders. Um, and serotonin is known to be involved in um, regulation of early development. So the serotonin system is, is an important neurotransmitter, which is relevant to, to autism and to fragile X. Um, but targeting the serotonin system is, uh, has been a complex challenge. Um, for many years because there's many receptors, because it's a very extensive system. And the novelty that we are bringing um, is that this drug candidate, NLX101, um, is different because it really is exceptionally selective for one particular receptor of the serotonin system. And, and we think that's a very important uh, feature of uh, this drug candidate. When we study the publications or the current treatment regimen for fragile X patients, we notice that existing treatment options or drug candidates, uh, they target a limited, um, I would say, um, some of the symptoms. So we discovered that our uh, candidate, the name is a GXV01. This compound preclinically, it has a triple actions on the axis of uh, hormone and uh, neurotransmitter and the neurotrophic factors. And in fact, we also um, found this compound uh, quite efficacious in addressing by anxiety, autistic uh, behavior symptoms, social stress um, in non-rodent and rodent animal models. So with this data, and we want to eventually uh, aim to develop a drug that has impact on uh, broad spectrum of symptoms in uh, fragile X syndrome and thereby to provide the patients with uh, better uh, treatment options and hope to avoid uh, polypharmacy. We are very happy to announce that it's just uh, June 2022, the last month, we received the approval for phase one trial in Australia and we have started the enrollment of uh, healthy volunteers for the study. Um, hope to have the first dose in human uh, in July or the third quarter this year. Then the next milestone will be, of course, safety is the first uh, um, the priority. So we want to first demonstrate the uh, safety tolerability in human and also to uh, prove that this compound has a favorable PK profile in human. We also did some, well, we want to uh, obtain biomarker uh, data, uh, which will help us to define the starting dose in a uh, phase two study at which like a uh, pharmacological uh, effect can be affected in the patient population. It's unique, in my opinion, to have a drug which is Briastatin and other of the compound drugs that we have, which are in our platform. We have many of these, Briastatin is the lead. It, we think it's fairly unique to have a drug that is specifically targeting synaptic growth and restoration, as well as preventing neuronal death. 
It also does other things, but its major focus is synaptic growth. The, the beauty of the bryostatin, which targets something called PKC epsilon, and then its major target, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. It also targets other growth factors, a whole repertoire of synaptic growth factors. There's a beautiful molecular pathway that actually believe, begins with gene expression, um, and mRNA longevity, um, that is targeted by bryostatin PKC epsilon. And we've worked that out. And it turns out that, again, it has this essentially diffuse, but very, very focused, diffuse effect on synaptic growth, as well as neuronal preservation. We're very much uh, an early stage drug discovery project in this case. Um, so, as I mentioned, based on the understanding of the disease mechanism and uh, how nerve cells connect with each other and that the synapse is a key part of how nerve cells connect with each other, we un understand based on some basic research uh, what might be happening at the synapse uh, in the fragile X syndrome. And therefore, we have a hypothesis of, of how we might be able to have small molecule drugs that can alter the function of a key protein that is involved in the structure and function of the synapse. So we've been funded for this project a bit, uh, from the Medical Research Council, so that's the UK government. And what's, what's encouraging for the Fragile X community is that the Medical Research Council clearly recognise the unmet need in fragile X syndrome and, and I guess liked our hypothesis and funded the project as it's been a two year project which we're just coming to the end of. Now we're funded to identify some small molecules that alter the function of the protein that we're interested in and that we've identified those compounds in the, in the test tube if you will. So those small molecule inhibitors of the, the key kinase that's involved in the synapse. Uh, those compounds are selective, uh, so they affect just this kinase that we're interested in and not others. They work in cellular models, so they can enter the cell and inhibit the kinase in the cell. Um, the main issues I am trying to address in Fragile X is the brain-related phenotype. So, um, fragile X uh, leave us with a very interesting scenario, right? In terms of um, how we can tackle the brain-related alterations. So, hyperactivity, social alterations, cognitive disturbances are mainly the fields I am addressing. And I am very keen of trying to understand how and why this alteration in the FMRP, also in the fragile X protein, are leading to these alterations and how these can be then tackled if we really get insight into the mechanisms that are behind those um, kind of findings, right? So basically what we are keen of doing is trying to help people with fragile X to overcome all these brain-related phenotypes. Our lab is mainly, I mean, we think that uh, we need to really understand what are the mechanisms behind the phenotypes, the concrete phenotypes, because not all of the phenotypes that are present in fragile X syndrome are driven by the same mechanisms, right? So what we need to do is we need to dissect these phenotypes and then try to understand the mechanisms behind. And then based on that, we can address this possible problems by using something that is different, that is mechanism-based therapies. So we found one of the pathways altered. Well, let's go for it and think about one thing that is very important, that is fragile X is not only in brain, 
is a multi-systemic disorder. So many things that happen in the periphery also affect the brain. And this is something that has only been tangentially taken into account. So our approach are very kind of holistic, trying to also not only focus on drugs, but on multimodal interventions. At StudyCLA, our initial focus in neurodevelopmental disorders was on idiopathic uh, autism spectrum disorder. And um, our vision uh, was to uh, find uh, new ways uh, to characterize patients beyond uh, behavioral characterization, uh, to be able uh, to uh, translate uh, this characterization into uh, biological uh, and uh, phenotypical markers that could serve as clinical inclusion criteria in clinical trials and result in greater uh, signal uh, at the biological level and hopefully uh, translate into a better match with uh, therapeutics. And uh, while working in the idiopathic autism field and uh, entering um, a clinical development for uh, our precision uh, autism pipelines, we realized that um, in uh, Fragile X, despite the condition being a monogenetic condition, there was also a heterogeneity uh, in clinical response to uh, drugs. And so um, we realized that uh, uh, recent work had established that variation methylation uh, status in patients uh, could uh, uh, possibly uh, be an avenue to pursue, but that beyond uh, these specific, uh, these fragile X specific variations, the rest uh, of the gene expression uh, of these patients could uh, uh, provide insight into uh, drug response. And we realized that our platform could be applied beyond uh, idiopathic uh, autism uh, stratification to a monogenetic disorder stratification. So we engaged in observational biosampling studies to uh, be able to uh, seek first uh, validation of our technology applied in the monogenetic uh, disorder context. And we did this in collaboration with um, uh, academic centers uh, revisiting previously failed um, fragile X uh, trials to uh, be able to see if we could uh, blindly enrich uh, population for responders. Anavix has a strong preclinical and clinical rationale for fragile X. We have so far a very broad and upstream mode of action that is known to be implicated in neurodevelopmental diseases. Uh, by activating the Sigma-1 receptor, which confers neuroprotective efforts, effects in several models of neurodevelopmental, but also neurodegenerative diseases, including fragile X. Administration of Anavex Sosium 3 results in improvement in all these pathologies. And these improvements are overlapping because we believe they are connected by caused by cellular stress. And in fragile X, the genetic dis dysfunction is causing cellular stress. Another advantage is that Adonvex 273 is given orally and it's easy to administer. Adonvex 273 has been shown to be safe. We have developed uh, and seen in uh, our animal models very strong response to a BDNF restoration and also restoration of AKT uh, biomarkers, which we also were also able to identify in blood. So what we're now doing as a next step is to test the drug on Avex 273 in a fragile X clinical trial in patients. And we expect to trial this uh, to start uh, this year. And uh, we are very excited about it, given the rationale of the um, ability to restore functionality in uh, these several animal models of fragile X. At Kairos, we are developing targeted therapeutics for underlying ion channel dysfunction uh, in Fragile X, uh, ion channel function that contributes to uh, hyperexcitability of the nervous system. And uh, we are specifically focused on a very unique uh, potassium channel known as BK. So I, I think what really differentiates what we're doing at KRIS and our program on BK from other programs in the space is we have identified a, a very exciting biomarker 
that we think uh, is linked to our channel is abnormal in Fragile X patient and involves uh, visual function. Uh, so the channel is expressed in, in the eye and we know that the abnormalities in, in visual function are a key part of Fragile X. We've actually identified using elect electroretinography or ERG, uh, which is simply measuring the electrical response of the eye to a flash of light. It can be done very non-invasively in patients. We've actually uh, observed abnormalities in the ERG in the genetic mouse model of Fragile X, and we've actually also demonstrated this in Fragile X patients, uh, studies that we have uh, published in the, in the literature. Now, what makes that really unique is it gives us a chance to go into clinical trials with a, mi a marker that tells us that we're getting our drug to the target we are, are expecting to hit and we can move that marker with our compound. So the ability to use that for dose selection and even patient selection as we head into phase two studies is really uh, very tangible for us. So we are developing a, an oral treatment for Fragile X syndrome, which, which is a, a, an advantage, I guess, although there, there have been other uh, oral therapies for Fragile X syndrome that have been uh, tested in the clinic. I mean, we have uh, the modality that we're utilizing uh, by addressing a key part of the etiology of the disease has the potential to be disease modifying. And um, our approach by using early biomarkers such as DEG, um, then that can give us uh, uh, greater confidence that we're actually, the drug is actually reaching the target and it's actually um, doing what it's supposed to be doing, for example, by normalizing the neuronal hyperexcitability, um, which you can see in the EEG. The EEG uh, would allow us, the biomarker EEG work would allow us to establish really early on a PKPD correlation, which is so important in drug development, but it's uh, relatively challenging in CNS indications, which is the case of Fragile X syndrome. So um, I think by doing, uh, utilizing our approach by the target that we selected, that's central to Fragile X syndrome, as well as the biomarker approach, we can have a very strong uh, way to advance this therapy WOWS is a novel targeted therapy and we are inhibiting the activity of a protein kinase called S6K1 using a small molecule compound called SOL784. Klan and others have shown that in Fragile X patients and model mice, S6K1 is overactivated in the brain compared to healthy counterparts and this drives excessive protein synthesis leading to pathology. To date, the drugs available to Fragile X patients treat symptoms only. Probably the greatest value of our approach is that we have the potential to treat the underlying root cause of the disease. This in turn has the potential to improve profound aspects such as cognition. To date, there has never been an S6K1 inhibitor in the clinic for Fragile X syndrome, so our approach is differentiated over what has come before. So our candidate drug, SOL784, has shown promising preclinical effects in several models of Fragile X syndrome, giving us good confidence in taking this molecule forward. We have plans to put SOL784 into phase one clinical trial. As data and new technologies allow for more rapid identification of promising repurposing candidates, many available drugs have been repurposed as potential treatments for neurodevelopmental disorders. In the case of Fragile X, how can we harness the power of data artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other computational biology approaches to discover new therapeutic uses for approved or investigational drugs. In this conversation, our distinguished speakers will share their insights about drug repurposing. You know, I'm excited to be here today and learn more about what the companies are doing. And Bruce, with the technical background you have and scientific background, really looking to dialogue with you and, and learn. Great. Well, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I think it's important that the Fragile X community learn as much about what kinds of things are happening out in the therapeutic space. And uh, so anything we can do to share information about drug repurposing, drug redevelopment, drug repositioning, 
in our conversation today is really important. No, that's great. Thanks. I mentioned this to you before. Uh, my son has fragile X, he's nine. And so for me, you know, the, the appeal here are kind of options, like w- what's out there, what may be out there, what's on the horizon. And in some cases, you know, what can I do to help? Um, you be part of the trial, uh, cheer on the sidelines, you know, just how to help the movement, how to help kind of move things forward in any capacity. I think as, as parents and as family members, we're very interested in that. And as we discussed, I have a, my nephew, Alex, is uh, now over 40 years old, and he also has Fragile X. So I've been part of his life and watched the progression of his growth. Um, he's been on a couple of clinical trials earlier on. And uh, so it's, it's both personally important to me and scientifically important to me that we advance some therapies for Fragile X patients as quickly as possible. So, you know, I think, Andres, it's, a, it's important to talk about when you think about developing a therapy for Fragile X, there's certainly, there's gene therapies where we might try and, you know, change things at the very root of the problem and the, and the X chromosome, all the way to, to things like small molecules that might hit one or two of the symptoms that patients are uh, are presenting with. And it's, it's really important to think about that in the way um, that therapies are developed. And one of the ways that some companies, including the company that I work for, Helix, is developing therapies is starting with known molecules that are human safe. So those mm-hmm. could be drugs that have been approved in one or more jurisdictions. Those could be nutraceuticals, which are you know, the things that we buy at the General Nutrition Nutrition Center or someplace else that we take, you know, vitamins, minerals, supplements, those kinds of nutraceuticals, almost all of which have strong biochemical impact in the body. They're just not approved as drugs, but they're very useful as potential therapeutics. And then there are molecules that are, are drug-like that are in company pipelines that have either been developed for one thing and maybe it failed or are being developed for many things that have already been proven human safe in, a, in an early phase trial. And so Helix and, uh, and other companies start with those as a backbone to see, can we find a, uh, another use for that to treat a disease, a multifocal disease like Fragile X? So, um, you know, in our case, we've started and, and came up with lots of different drugs that there's some scientific evidence that there might be an impact in a disease like Fragile X. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, that companies do is they have different ways of looking at those kinds of drugs or nutraceuticals or compounds to see how they might impact it. Uh, one way that um, we look at is to look at all the scientific information and medical information that's out there and let a computer make connections between each piece of data and every other piece of data that's in our database. And what it, it lets us do is it lets us um, find discoverable biology that's already been created through all the research that people have done around all sorts of diseases, including fragile X, but in lots of other diseases. And the computers you know, use algorithms that are created by our computational biologists to search through these uh, masses of data and tease out the connections to try and get an evidence chain between starting with a disease like Fragile X and, and going all the way to some kind of human safe compound that's already uh, available for human use. And so um, it's really exciting that computational biology allows us mm-hmm. to do this kind of thing. It would be almost impossible for a human scientist to keep track of all those data connections and then you know, get from one end to the other. But the computer can do that and then turn that information over to a human pharmacologist who can then see, does it make sense? Is it strong enough? Um, Is that drug potentially safe in that patient population? 
you know, what kinds of symptoms is this likely to attack? What might be the potential way that it works, its mechanism of action, its target, the pathway that it's gonna interact with. So the, the computational biology piece uh, added to the, the starting with a known compound, which some people call drug repurposing or drug repositioning. At Helix, we call it drug redevelopment because in the end, it seems unlikely that any molecule that's already available exactly the way it is is going to be able to, you know, target something as specific as the disease caused by the fragile X uh, mm -hmm. gene issues. But starting with something that seems like it should work and works a little bit, then you can tweak that molecule and make it so that it it works better for that patient population. And we think that's a really exciting way to more quickly, more safely uh, get to the patient population and hopefully with a higher probability of success. Yeah, I, I mean, I think for me, I think that's the exciting part about it is that, you know, the timetable, right, is likely reduced. And so I, I think about even, you know, again, it comes down to anecdotal, you know, perspective from my, my own experience with my son and kind of going through the process to establish what's the right dosing and, and medication regimen for him that works. And what we found is something that's been effective for him and it's been modified a bit over the years. And to me, it's that's almost similar to what we are doing with aggregating this, this massive amount of data with already, you know, effective and proven drugs, trying to find, a, you know, maybe it's a, too much of a simple analogy, but like a, a cocktail or a recipe that provides a lot of benefit. Because I tell you the the, you know, where we where we are now is is significantly improved to where we were pre some of these uh, medications when, when we had them tweaked. The exciting thing for us is to supplement that kind of, uh, you know, patient physician uh, general observational research that's going on with the kind of uh, drug redevelopment that would be non-obvious. So, you know, many of the companies like Helix that are working in this space can use the, the artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other computational biology to find things that wouldn't be that obvious, like, you know, a drug in a totally different class that might actually improve mm. anxiety or improve sleep that hasn't ever been tested for or, you know, used in that uh, context. You know, well, I also like the idea of the computer modeling, you know, and, and the simulations because it reduces some of the need to get, you know, in a clinic, essentially, right? So when we talk about even clinical design, clinical study design, just how do you bring somebody into the process with high anxiety and, you know, these challenges that, you know, we, medical and healthcare treatment will always be necessary because we're, we're humans and we need to care. Yeah, I, you know, the, some of the computer modeling that, that we'll hope to rely on someday is, uh, you know, can we model what a placebo group would look like so that we don't have to put any living patients in the mm -hmm. placebo group and they can all be on treatment? Because I know how hard that is for families that participate in clinical trials, not knowing whether they're getting the treatment drug or the placebo drug. That's interesting because I, I was thinking also about you know, at the end, at a, at a point where we do have um, new, you know, effective medicines, well, what's the, the delivery mechanism? I can tell you, thinking about getting my, getting Gael a COVID shot, it, you know, in itself has been a, a program, just how do we work to getting in, to getting his vaccine shot, which is, which is a challenge. So thinking about a medicine, you know, how do we get him to, at, at, in a future point in time, if there's a medicine, if it's going to be delivered through a syringe, which is going to be a challenge, you know, if it's a pill, uh, we've we've come up for solutions for that, and luckily we we got him to take uh, solid dose pills uh, with a nice dosage of Nutella on the spoon, uh, and it seems to work. Um, you know, so you know how you administer. I mean, especially for for someone that has high anxiety. You know, then you like like I said earlier, you kind of create a barrier for other health treatments that are essential as well. Um, you know, something to consider. But yeah. yeah. Well, I, I look forward to all the other uh, work that we're going to do together with the Fragile X community. It's really been great talking to you. Um, I wish you and your family and especially your son the best. And uh, 
we'll keep plugging away at Helix and other companies to make sure we can deliver therapeutics that are uh, safe and efficacious as quickly as possible. Well, well, thanks for all you do. It was a pleasure talking to you. I learned a ton. And you know, for all those out there doing awesome work in this space, just thank you. Uh, we keep checking in and we're excited about what's to come. So thank you. Repurposing of drugs to treat both common and rare diseases is becoming an increasingly attractive proposition to many researchers. Let's learn from our next panel of innovators on their current drug repurposing strategies for Fragile X Syndrome. What are they most excited about? What's next milestones they hope to accomplish? The key about any therapeutic development is having a target and then having a target that is selective. Uh, and potent with a safety profile uh, that would be make this tolerable and safe. This is safe and tolerable. It's easy to administer orally or in a liquid formulation. Our approach uh, for Fragile X is really focusing on mechanisms of disease and how uh, a drug may have influence on some of the mechanisms of disease. So we're developing a broad neuroprotective agent. This is called predopidine. This is the most selective and potent Sigma-1 agonist around. And selectivity is very important for optimal efficacy and safety. And this acts to enhance neuroprotective pathways, increases BDNF, has big impact on synaptic plasticity, and would have widespread utility in numerous neurodegenerative and neurodevelopmental disorders. In the past, we've shown that this drug can influence synaptic plasticity, stabilize spines, alter and restore calcium regulation, and also enhance BDNF deficiency, where BDNF deficiency is a feature of Fragile X. It also enhances the transport and uh, 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 development of BDNF secretion. It also has impact on mitochondrial function. It reduces ER stress and enhances autophagy, all of which may be important mechanisms which play a role in the pathogenesis of Fragile X. So we're targeting Sigma-1, which has broad effects in terms of secondary effects and this drug appears to be the most potent, safe, therapeutically uh, 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 tolerable, and is specific for these particular mechanisms. It's a novel approach because it is the most selective Sigma-1 agonist. And this would be suitable also in giving in combination therapy with gene therapy or cell therapy. And we've already shown demonstrated efficacy in preclinical models done under the supervision of Dr. Pilati, and also in other neurodevelopmental models, including vanishing white matter disease and neurodegenerative disease like Huntington disease. So the establishment of this particular path uh, the, of a drug that impacts these pathways in a very selective, safe and tolerable way is what differentiates our approach. I believe the greatest differentiated value of our modality is the fact that uh, we're developing uh, models that um, mo more closely mimic uh, the human physiology. And, um, and so these are, um, uh, uh, you know, um, cell culture based uh, systems that are amenable to high throughput screening that can easily um, or more easily be used uh, in drug screening. Um, studies. Uh, there are also models where we uh, can uh, better reproduce some of the complexity of the human, uh, human brain. And uh, we believe that this allows us to uh, better uh, understand uh, the complexity of, and the clinical features in patients. Our approach um, builds upon decades of progress in genetics and fundamental neurobiology. Mark Bear and I pioneered a new approach to the development of disease modifying and life altering treatments for Fragile X Syndrome. Specifically, individuals with Fragile X Syndrome can be distinguished by a common set of physical characteristics and behaviors, thus defining a syndrome. Once it became possible to perform molecular genetic studies, 
it was discovered that disruption in a single gene, FMRP, uh, that prevented the expression of a single protein was the cause of Fragile X syndrome. The next step was scientific discoveries um, that made it possible to introduce this uh, a disruption in this very same gene in animal models. Um, and once we were able to do that, we could understand how the, the deficiency of this single protein interfered with uh, brain development and developed therapeutics that specifically corrected the molecular impairments that cause fragile X syndrome. Now we identified two different classes of drugs uh, with two different mechanisms of action and brought those into clinical trials. And our baclofen, our lead product, produced the greatest magnitude of benefit in humans with fragile X syndrome. And we're currently focused on gaining regulatory approval and making our baclofen available to individuals with fragile X syndrome as soon as possible. The uniqueness of the approach that Curious AI is using is that the drug combination that we've uh, discovered and uh, are using, uh, originally uh, discovered by uh, Professor Nisim Ben Venisti of the Hebrew University uh, in Israel and in license by Curious. The approach we're taking for Fragile X uh, is really a novel uh, one. We're using a bio AI platform, meaning a platform that combines AI together with patients on chip and uh, stem cell genomic diversity uh, to get a better uh, simulation of the human uh, body and uh, in this case of uh, the, the uh, Fragile X uh, model. The uh, uniqueness of the approach that uh, we are taking is that a drug uh, is, is uh, offered uh, which addresses the root cause of the disease. The root cause of, of uh, Fragile X is an epigenetic inhibition of the fMR1 gene, uh, causing a, a lack of fMRP uh, protein in the brain. The drug combination which we develop prevents the inhibition, the epigenetic inhibition of fMR1 uh, uh, gene, and hence, uh, if successful, uh, would allow a uh, reversal of uh, and the curing of the disease itself. This is not a downstream approach of addressing um, um, uh, downstream uh, proteins or genes or symptoms, but rather treating the root cause of the disease. Purposeful is uh, taking the drug repurposing route. Uh, we are looking at small molecules, uh, marketed drugs and nutraceuticals. So uh, agents that have already been tested and uh, we know their safety profiles and we're looking for either the drugs or the combinations. I think the main difference uh, uh, from our side is, is explainable AI, uh, which is uh, significantly different uh, compared with uh, black box uh, methods on the technological level. Uh, but also uh, the fact that we do drug repurposing um, and the fact that we do combinations, we realize that Fragile X is a complicated disorder. We believe that uh, the solution to relieving multiple phenotypes lies in combination therapies. Our approach is, is to use these combination uh, therapies to better alleviate phenotypes both on the behavioral level and the cognitive level. We suggested uh, a handful of candidates that, that could possibly uh, work. We validated in the animal model and now we are in the middle of a pilot phase two trial at, at Rush which uh, may be uh, may be completed by the end of the year. Our approach is, is quite different from what has traditionally been done within the field of, of drug discovery in general, but even more specifically in the field of Fragile X. Um, in the sense that what we have seen, and if I focus specifically on the field of Fragile X, uh, we generally see two approaches in the field, which is companies who develop a drug not specifically for Fragile X and think that there might be some biological reason why it would also work for Fragile X, but they're starting with a drug that has already been developed. Um, the second traditional approach that we see is um, people doing 
screenings, so trying every drug that is out there and seeing if one of them work on fragile X, which is really this repurposing approach. Um, what we're really trying to do using these machine learning techniques is using data from these trials to figure out what biologically drives symptoms of patients and which drug targets can we extract from all of this data that um, has been generated out there over, over the many years that there have been research on, on Fragile X. And can we find drugs, once again, in a computational manner that selectively um, modulates these, uh, these drug targets? So we're trying to do much more from a computational perspective and we're trying to do it in an agnostic way. So we're not starting from existing. The existing drugs is really like a starting point for us. Um, but we're trying to find something that is really specific to Fragile X to ensure that we have the best possible response in patients. My research and the way we have approached Fragile X is to look at sort of the deep, deep molecular profiling of synapses. Um, the, the technology we're using allows us to look at, you know, dozens of proteins within every single synapse of a single piece of brain, right? Um, so this way, what we can actually do is we can use the molecular profiles of each synapse and um, classify them into individual classes. And then we're able to look at the subtypes specifically in terms of how it changes in Fragile X and how different types of drugs uh, given to the animal actually affects these synapses. And so what we actually found is actually really quite fascinating. I mean, a lot of synapses, you, know, you compare the wild type sibling to the Fragile X sibling are not changed, but there are very distinct subpopulation synapses in very distinct regions of the brain that changes. Um, with the loss of the FMRP protein. So I think what you're actually seeing in this case is that we are talking about a developmental disease, right? There are going to be certain drugs that are going to be good for certain types of synaptic changes and not others. So the, my technique allows us to really sort of get at the root of these different types of changes and how they respond to pharmacology. And the goal is to really, right, figure out which mechanisms changes which type of synapses, can we design synergies with combinatorial treatment to actually get a more complete rescue? And what are those, those particular synapses that regardless of what type of drugs you just can't change? And how meaningful is that in terms of the behavior? One of the uh, most important uh, works we, we are doing recently is to uh, derive uh, induced stem cells, iPSCs, from uh, patients with a distinct uh, behavior and uh, brain uh, electric activity phenotypes. The reason we want to do that is because there's a really diverse uh, kind of representation and uh, severity among fragile patients. And, this uh, diversity has contributed to, uh, to a lot of the complexity in clinical trial design and the readout. And some of the clinical trials may actually have a, a run into this complication of a data interpretation because of diverse represent representation of a patient, um, patient severity and, uh, and uh, symptoms. So because of a, uh, that we decided to derive the iPS seed uh, stem cells from the patient with a distinct representation in their severity and the, and the drug response. And this is a collaboration with us, uh, clinicians and also basic scientists and computation scientists. And our goal is to try to identify, so what are the underlying mechanism for this differences in severity? And can we derive um, develop an in vitro model in the cell culture model that we can test some of these drugs before they need to be applied to human uh, clinical trial or, or uh, patient um, treatment. So this is a really exciting because this is highly relevant to 
what actually uh, need to be applied to patients in the future and uh, highly relevant to uh, some, some of the uh, more pressing and fundamental questions in bedrocks research and treatment. Please welcome Richard Saul, head of Boston office and senior advisor of strategic initiatives, Wuxi Aptech, who will close out our event. Fragile X syndrome is the most common known cause of inherited intellectual disability worldwide. Although there is no cure for Fragile X yet, our distinguished speakers address their vision of the future and the promising technologies that will take us across that journey. Through collaboration, we will provide unwavering support to every family affected by Fragile X. We have a shared vision that advances in sciences and technologies coupled to strong patient advocacy will lead to a significant improvement in the lives of those affected by Fragile X and perhaps a cure for the disorder. We all look forward to working together in the years ahead to realize that shared commitment, doing the right thing for patients and their families across the globe and fulfilling the promise of future medicine in a multidisciplinary collaborative environment. On behalf of Wuxi Abtec family, I'd like to express my gratitude to the distinguished speakers for sharing their perspectives and remarkable insights. To the Fraxa Research Foundation and many other supportive partners for your wonderful collaborations in the programming. And to our audience, thank you all for joining and participating from all over the world. At Wuxi Abtec, we all believe in a future where every drug can be made and every disease can be treated. This future is only possible if we continue to work closely and collaboratively together. Thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at the next episode of our Collaborations That Transform series. Thank you very much. <laughs>